We have a, a large text today of Scripture, um, a little different than what I normally do. We kind of take a smaller passage that's appropriate to the point uh, of the text and try to um, expose that. But today, as in my study, I, I, I've looked at this chapter, and the entire chapter is trying to make a, a, an overall point. And that's what we want to see is what is this writer trying to portray? What, what does he want us to see? What is the point of this? And what I see in this passage, chapter 10 of Acts, is a journey. Now we're taking a journey through the entire book of Acts to, to get the big picture. But we see kind of a mini journey here. And in some ways it's, it's almost the pivotal point of Acts. For the book of Acts we see the birth of the church. We see God's mighty hand moving throughout um, Jerusalem, Samaria, and Judea. And then ultimately, as we'll see in cha uh, chapter 10 today, the entire world, the Gentile world that the, the gospel is being delivered to. So we see what I call a grace journey beginning to take place here. God's grace manifested in Jesus in the gospel is beginning to go throughout the entire world, to the Gentile world. And that should make all of us extremely happy and grateful because we are the Gentile world. We're part of that. So we should all be so grateful for this grace journey that we see in chapter 10. Now, there's so much to read that we're going to take it in bits at a time. We won't read it up front in one setting. So I'll... In each point, we'll read a passage of chapter 10. But we were introduced today to a man named Cornelius. We've already seen Peter. We've already been introduced to him. And we'll talk about him some in this passage as well. But this man named Cornelius is another character that has risen up in the book of Acts. And th this is the first time we'll see the gospel taken directly to the home of of a Gentile. So God is sovereignly putting the pieces in place for the gospel to get to the entire world. So in one sense, the scene that we're seeing played out in chapter 10 is the turning point. From here, the gospel fans out to the entire world. And God declares the gospel is for the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Amen? It's an incredible thing that is a pivotal point, not only in the book of Acts, but actually in the entire New Testament. So a lot of this takes place in Caesarea, which was an important coastal town where the uh, Roman prefect lived, the leader there, and it was heavily Roman, um, Roman influence in so many different ways. So this man named Cornelius that we're introduced to is a centurion. A centurion is a commander of one of the six units of 100 men within what they call a cohort. A cohort would have been about 600 members and would have been part of a legion of about 6,000 men. So this man named Cornelius had a lot of, of influence in many, many ways. He was uh, well thought of and had a lot of power in his position. But the Bible gets a little more specific about this man named Cornelius. And I want you to know him a little better. It describes him as being a devout man. It simply means he fears God and he leads his entire household in such devotion. So this is one of the players in the, in the passage today. Not only was he devout, but he was a God-fearing man. He was a giver of alms. He gave generously. He prayed continually, the scripture says. It simply means he prayed often. He was constantly in an attitude of prayer, which I think that's what the Apostle Paul meant when he says pray without ceasing. Just have that continual communion with our incredible God continuously. This was this man named Cornelius. And so... He's so important in our passage today. He and Peter, and we see how God is beginning to sovereignly use these two men in different ways, in different personalities, to get the gospel to the world, to take them on this journey of grace, of the grace of God in Christ Jesus being displayed 
by the gospel, through the gospel, to the world. So, ultimately, this is the overall picture of the gospel going to every land. That is our goal. That is our mission as not only Baptists, but as believers. To get the gospel to the world. We see how this is done in this passage. So, we're going to look at several things about Cornelius and Peter on their grace journey. Here's the first thing. We see this in chapter 10 in verses 1 through 20. And guys up there, I don't have my clicker. I don't know where it is. So it's in your hands today. I'll do the best I can to guide you along. So the, number one, what we see is providential preparation. Providential preparation. In other words, we see God sovereignly preparing these two men. Cornelius, that we just briefly described, and Peter. Verses 1 through 8, he talks about Peter or Cornelius again. He says, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly a vision of an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he responded like so many others in Scripture where an angel approached. And he stared at him in terror. And don't look spiritual. You'd do the same thing, I'm sure. And said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who was called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So you see where God is, is focusing in on this man named Cornelius who obviously was a beloved servant of God and who loved God, loved the Lord Jesus, and was obedient and submissive and surrendered to the will of God. And God is sovereignly preparing him for this grace journey to get the gospel to the world. He specifically approached him, specifically said, Cornelius, this is what I want you to do, preparing him for the journey. We see this in Peter as well. He prepared Cornelius, and now he prepares Peter. Verse 9. The next day as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing, he fell into a trance. And listen to these words. And he saw the heavens open, and something like a great sheet descending being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean do not call uncommon. This happened three times. Peter was a bit hard-headed. <laughs> three times and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. So what on earth is happening here? Cornelius was a little easier to prepare, it appears to us today. Cornelius was a devout man, a godly man, a God-fearing man who gave and had a heart of, of giving and who prayed continually and communed with God. And then we have this description of Peter who, at least at this moment, it appears that his mind was still a bit back in the Old Covenant days. Now, be reminded, these, uh, this is a Jewish man who was raised, his entire family, his, his line was all about the Old Covenant at that moment. And the Old Covenant and its, its sacrificial system 
Things were clean, things were unclean, and they were very aware of these things. The Old Testament lays those things out very clearly. His entire family, his forefathers, talked about these things. They were, they were extremely cautious and careful in how they approached these things. It was their life. Now, ultimately, they did understand that these things were pointing to the ultimate sacrifice, which was Jesus. But at times, those things around us become the main thing. And when that happens, that can be very, very dangerous. And far too often we see in Scripture where the old covenant, the old sacrificial system, became very comfortable for people. And at times it was as if they got their eyes off the point of that, which is Jesus, and onto the system itself. And it appears that that is what's happening to Peter to some degree and somehow because it was so ingrained in him that God had to prepare him for this grace journey of getting the gospel to us, to the world, to the Gentile world as well as the Jewish world. But again, the sacrificial system and the things that are clean, the things that are unclean were, was so ingrained in him that he wasn't prepared for that journey of grace yet. So God did this amazing thing where he, he showed Peter this vision. And I, I wish I've tried and tried to picture it in my mind, but I mean, the best that we can see is this sheet coming down with these things on it, these animals, these reptiles. And what it represented was that all things have become clean in the eyes of God and ultimately through Christ. And Peter really, really struggled with this. He struggled with it, I believe, because of the old system that was still in his mind and his heart. We see this in Hebrews where there were those Jewish believers who were falling back in a sense to that old sacrificial system. We see it in the book of James. We see it in other places. We definitely see it in this passage. So God had to prepare Peter for this point. Nothing's different with us, folks. We struggle with the same things. We're the same flesh that Peter was made of and everybody else in our passage today. We deal with the same issues, different time, different place, but the same flesh, the same all around issues. There are things that we have been brought up with, things that we don't, that we think are unclean or not worthy in some way that affect negatively our goal to get the gospel to the world. We all struggle with it to one degree or the other. Whether it is someone of another race that we just kind of avoid. We'll go minister and preach the gospel to our folks. But somebody else can deal with these people. I don't want to be around them. I don't want to think about them. I don't like what they do. Folks, if we don't like what they do, that's more reason they need the gospel. Right? And let, let's be specific here for just a moment, moment. We've talked about this some on Sunday mornings and on Wednesdays. And let's get real here. What about ISIS itself? Brutal, deadly, uh, uh, ungodly mindset that they have. And you all know I'm being honest today. That is who they are. They're brutal people. And, and they need to be judged, right? Of course. But we all do. They need to have things done to them to make them stop what they're doing, right? Of course. That's justice. But I'm telling you folks, nothing will change them like the gospel will. That's what they need more than anything. The gospel that's what they need. Syrian refugees. Should they come here? Should they not? I don't know. Y'all can sort through that one way or the other. But I know this. They need the gospel more than anything. People need the gospel. People of our race. People of other races. People of, of our mindset. People of other mindsets. They need the gospel. We've said this often. You work through all the political things one way or the other. You work through those things. But the core of our lives is to get the gospel to the world. Whomever it may be. Wherever they may be. And boy, I've seen God work in recent years like I've never seen as far as bringing the world 
to us. So we mentioned last week, some of us are hesitant to go to another country. Well, you hardly have to now. God's bringing them to us. So be prepared. Whatever it is in our hearts that is keeping us from sharing the gospel with the world, stop it. <laughs> Surrender that to God. This is what Peter, this is the process that Peter had to work through as well. Look at verse 17. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, here again, God providentially moving. The men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Peter, who was, uh, uh, whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, these men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. So we see God providentially preparing these two men to get the gospel to the world. Folks, He is preparing us as well. Do you see that? Can you see it in your life? Can I see it in my life where He is putting things in place, putting us around certain people, putting us under the preaching of the Word, whatever it may be, to blast those walls in our lives that are keeping us from getting the gospel to the world. We call it preparation, providential pre preparation. So let's look how this developed. Here's the second thing. We first see providential preparation, and now we begin to see submissive hearts from providential preparation by God to these men to submissive hearts. And we'll look at this passage in a moment, but I want to read this quote to you by one writer who said, Peter and Cornelius model the obedience God commands both at the point of salvation and throughout the Christian life. The Bible repeatedly teaches that obedience company accompanies true faith. And we see that, don't we? If you've truly trusted in Christ, there will be obedience to different degrees at different times for different people. It all looks different. All of us look have our obedience uh, uh, built at different times and in different ways, but ultimately there will be obedience. And we see that happening in the passage in, in verses 11 through 33. And we'll just kind of, you can read that on your own there, but ultimately we begin to see Cornelius and especially Peter submit and have submissive hearts to this grace journey. Then the third thing we see, out of providential proclamation and out of submissive hearts, is the gospel proclaimed. This is what we want to see. This is, this is our mission. This is what, what we're after here, the gospel proclaimed. So look at verse 34. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears Him, anyone who fears Him and does what is right and is acceptable to Him. As for the word that He sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, He's Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing and all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. And then verse 43. To him 
All the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in Him receives forgiveness of sins through His name. Well, look what God is doing here. He has providentially prepared Cornelius and Peter. And then they have submissive hearts. And then here we clearly see the gospel is proclaimed. What we see in this passage, verses 34 through 43, is a Christ-centered, gospel-centered sermon. We see Peter do this so often with his submissive heart. And that is what we are to be about. We are to be prepared. We are to have submissive hearts. And then we are to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Folks, there's a lot of things to proclaim in our day. A lot of things that we can be about. A lot of things that we can be doing. And we should be about those things. But the main thing is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing trumps that. And we should let nothing trump that. When we are prepared and we, we have submissive hearts, that is when we take the gospel to the world. And this is what we see happening. Peter, this man who had become somewhat hardened, apparently, now has a submissive heart and his main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And that is the gospel. So he proclaims boldly the death, burial, and resurrection of the gospel and anyone who trusts in him, anyone of any nation, has eternal life. The gospel proclaimed. And on top of that, it continues to build. Here's the fourth thing. Not only do we see gospel proclaimed, but we see power displayed. Verse 44. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on even the Gentiles. Let's pause there a moment. So here, not only was Peter amazed in this vision that he had seen, he was perplexed about it, finally understood what, what he was seeing and what it was all about. He preached the gospel and those from other nations, Gentiles, not Jewish people, but Gentiles, began to believe on Christ, trust Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And the Jewish people were perplexed. They were amazed. Like, what? wait a minute. We're the Jews. We're the Jewish people. You Gentiles aren't supposed to have this. You are not part of this. But clearly they were. Clearly this vision that Peter had seen was being made manifest now. And those Gentiles were trusting in Christ and receiving the Holy Spirit. It's an incredible thing. Verse 46. Now look how this power was displayed in them. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? What a great question that Peter had. He, he read the minds of his fellow Jewish brethren. And no doubt, somehow they were thinking, well, maybe we just won't give them water and they can't be baptized. But Peter said, can anyone withhold this act of identifying themselves with Christ? Baptism. No one can, for they are believers just as we are. 48, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Guys and gals, isn't this what we long to see? Isn't this it, really? Don't we want to see the world come to know Christ? Don't we want to see not only our little group, but don't we want to see Hampstead have this power? Don't we want to see them acknowledge their sin and trust in the sinless Christ? Don't we want to see them identify themselves with Christ, with the church, through baptism? 
Don't we want to see the world have this power that we have, the Holy Spirit Himself? And this is what we wanted. This is what Peter saw after he submitted, after God providentially prepared him, after he had a submissive heart, then he preached the gospel and saw this power display. And then, not only this power being displayed in all these, diff all these Gentiles, but believers identifying. That's the fifth thing we see. Look at verse 46. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And Peter declared again, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we? So he commanded them and they were baptized. Now, get the, get the power in this. These are Gentiles who at one time... None of the Jews thought that they would ever have any part of their God, uh, of this sovereign God, that it was for the Jewish people. They were the chosen ones and not the Gentile people. But all of a sudden, many come, came to know Him. Many Gentiles were believing on Christ and identifying themselves with Jesus, with the Messiah. Believers identified. Again, that should be our heart. That should be our goal. That should be our mission as believers. Believers in Christ. Here's the sixth thing, the final thing. And this is so sweet. This comes from, from all the things we've heard on this grace journey. The gospel fellowship. Look at the very last part of verse 48. Then they asked him to remain for some days. And what we see in here is koinonia fellowship, where they were fellowshipping with each other, where they were made one, not by their race, nothing like that, not by their political beliefs, not by their, the things they like to do, not by their families, but in Christ who breaks down all those walls of every kind that we build up as humans. And in Christ, they had fellowship. That's how some of you come together, because there are some of you who are completely different from others. Completely. And that's the beauty of the gospel, isn't it? That he brings, he breaks out all those walls, that mystery that Paul speaks of in Ephesians. How he broke down the wall between the Jews and the Gentiles that no one else could, no one else could even fathom that. That's the power of the gospel. That's what it does. And it creates this sweet fellowship that cannot be explained any other way but through Christ. This is this grace journey that Cornelius and Peter traveled in Acts chapter 10. And this is this grace journey that Hampstead Baptist Church needs to be about. We need to be on this road as well, this grace journey. Understanding it's by the grace of God, in Christ alone, for His glory alone, that we take the gospel to everybody. Everyone. And when we do this, there are some things that will happen to some things we need to look at. Here's the first one. You just have to listen to these. I don't have it on the, the screen. When we do this, there will be a high view of our great God. A high view of our great God. We will begin to see God as a God of grace. When we didn't deserve anything good, he gave it to us. When the last thing we deserved was Christ, was Jesus dying on the cross in our place. We didn't deserve that, yet He gave it to us. We'll see God as that. We'll see God as a God of mercy. When we deserved eternal punishment, He was merciful to us in Christ. When we didn't deserve any kind of love, the God who is love loved us. When we didn't deserve salvation, He gave us salvation. That is our great God. And when we go on this grace journey, when He prepares our hearts, when we have submissive hearts, and we go on that grace journey, when the gospel is proclaimed to the nations, we will have indeed a high view of our sovereign and great God. 
The second thing is in the form of a question. And I ask it to all of us. Will we be willing to go? Will we have submissive hearts? Like Cornelius, like Peter. Will we be willing to be used by God? Will we enjoy this grace journey or will we put our hands and feet on, on the door and refuse to let God use us? We all have to ask ourselves that question. Will we be willing to take the gospel to the entire world? Or will we be like Jonah who the last thing he wanted to do is take the gospel to those Ninevites, those mean, brutal, hateful Ninevites. Will we be submissive to the gospel? And it all comes down to this question. Will we trust Him? As believers, will we trust that God knows what He's doing? Will we trust Him to, to equip us and to prepare us? Will we trust Him for the ability to have submissive hearts? Will we trust our mighty God to be with us as we take the gospel to the world, whether that's your Muslim neighbor or if that's literally getting on a plane and going to another nation somewhere, whether that's your hard-hearted co-worker that you despise <laughs> or whomever it may be, will we trust God enough to do the work in us and others? to go on this grace journey like Cornelius and Peter did. I pray that we will. I pray that we'll be a, a body of believers that, that our lives are about this grace journey and that we've got this precious gospel in our hands and that we willingly, lovingly, and passionately take it to everyone. That we can look beyond the political issues and in spite of all that, that we understand the the reason people are mean and hateful and despicable is because they don't know Jesus. And it's only by the grace of God that we're not there as well. Amen?